started. Um, uh, so welcome everybody to um, today's ADRC lunch talk. Welcome to our ADRC participants and families and guests and trainees. Um, I'm Meg Sewell. I'm the Director of Education and Outreach for the ADRC, and I'm so excited about today's lunch talk on the new Alzheimer's treatment, Lakembi. Um, this talk is part of the ADRC's recognition of World Alzheimer's Month, when groups from around the world, people who are researchers, people who treat patients, and advocacy groups all come together to promote education and awareness of dementia and support of families coping with a diagnosis of dementia. So this is a very exciting time in our field and we have had many questions about some of the new developments and we gathered up a bunch of questions and we have Dr. Mary Sano, the director of our ADRC, who's gonna be here to answer a lot of those questions. Um, and at the end, we'll leave time for more questions if we didn't get to everything. Um, so before we start, just a little housekeeping. We are recording, um, but no one's face will be seen um, when, when we look at this video uh, later. Um, and if I could ask you to please, if you have questions, to type them into the chat at the bottom of the screen so that I can go through them one by one. Um, at the end, we're going to post a question or two for you to answer um, about your feedback for today's talk um, and what you'd like to hear about next. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Mary Sano to talk to us today. Welcome. Well, thank you, Dr. Sewell. It's always a joy to be with our participants and friends of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And it is really an exciting time. Uh, there's lots to know and a, a lot to think about. So um, I'm really glad for this chance to talk about uh, Lakenby, the new uh, the most recently approved agent for Alzheimer's disease. Um, as you know, I consult for many companies and I'm on many um, data and safety monitoring boards as well as having membership in companies. And I just wanted to share that with you. Um, so what will we cover today? Well, we'll talk a little bit about how Lakenby works and who it actually is for, at least as far as we know now. We'll talk about how effective it is um, I'll describe what Mount Sinai is doing to offer it. And I'll also tell you what else might be coming just a little bit. So you'll know wherever we are now, it's just the beginning of a journey to find the best treatments for Alzheimer's disease. So what is Lakenby and how does it work? So um, the name I'm gonna be using frequently as well as Lakenby is Lakanumab. That's the generic name of the drug. It's an, um, into antibody, a monoclonal antibody that is administered through an intravenous infusion. Um, it targets beta amyloid, the amyloid plaque, which is in the brain. And um, it has received what we call traditional approval from the US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, for the treatment of early Alzheimer's disease. So, um, we've been talking about other monoclonal antibodies that had other types of treatment, um, uh, other types of approval, and I'll be telling you why this goes beyond the um, first monoclonal antibodies. So it's indicated for people living with mild cognitive impairment, we call that MCI, and mild dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. So in this case, even the MCI must be due to Alzheimer's disease, and I'll review what that means in just a minute. Um, and these individuals have to have a confirmation of elevated beta amyloid in their brain. And we do that in many different ways. Uh, those of you who participate in our research know that right now, we can do this either through the collection of cerebral spinal fluid or through um, PET imaging techniques. Now, Lakembi lowers beta amyloid in the brain and it also reduces cognitive and functional decline in people living with Alzheimer's disease. And that's what moved it from what we used to call an accelerated approval to a traditional approval. And we'll talk about that data in just a minute. So I'm um, sharing with you, you know, there's, this is the first round of treatments in the past year or two that have come anywhere near addressing treatments for Alzheimer's disease. And so I wanted to take a little time to talk about where we are and what different perspectives are on this, um, 
this result. So this is from the website of the National Coalition of Aging, and it basically um, has a, a very balanced view. It says Alzheimer's medication is now going to be covered by Medicare, um, but the access still will have some limitations, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and the effectiveness um, is still in question. And I would say that is true for any new drug that enters the market. We can say that it's effective in clinical trials, but we really won't know how effective it is until we start to see it in the marketplace. So the FDA gave it its full approval and um, Medicare beneficiaries uh, will be eligible to be reimbursed, but with all Medicare costs, as you know, there's 20% that is not covered. And so if this is going to be covered for an individual, that will depend um, probably on any additional insurance that you might have. Um, it, the the current expectation is that the drug alone will be about $26,000 annually. Um, but again, we don't know what other kind of access programs. And there's a lot of care taken. There's a lot of care um, taken around this drug. There's a lot of imaging that you need to determine if you're eligible. And there's a lot of imaging you need to to ensure that it continues to be safe. And the medication currently is administered in an infusion center and all of those can have some added costs. The other thing um, about the development of this drug is it was done in early stage Alzheimer's patients and those who had mild cognitive impairment. And so whether or not it would be effective in more impaired individuals, we don't know yet and we'll have to see um, what kinds of studies we do next. So just to remind you, um, mild cognitive impairment is that condition where you have a cognitive deficit. And many of the people in the this study had a specific memory deficit, although sometimes it's a different kind of a deficit. Um, and what we know is those people rapidly progress to Alzheimer's disease or to dementia. But we also know that while amyloid can be responsible, there can be many other things that are responsible for mild cognitive impairment. And for a person to be eligible for this drug, they really need to have evidence that there is amyloid in the brain so we know that it can make a difference. So I'm going to take a minute to just talk about that because these were just tables and numbers, but now we have ways of measuring these things. So um, with Alzheimer's disease, there are three biomarkers of importance. The first one is the de depositing of amyloid. The second one is pathological tau. Um, which uh, ca causes fibrillate tangles. And then there's neurodegeneration. Neurodegeneration is not specific to Alzheimer's disease, but we think it tells you about the severity of the disease um, and about the staging of the disease. Um, so uh, this is a, a graphic that you've seen in the past, and it's about to be updated for a very specific reason. They call these the stages of Alzheimer's disease. And what you can see is that if a person has amyloid, even if they're asymptomatic, we had been calling them preclinical Alzheimer's with pathological changes. And then if you have MCI, we called it MCI of the Alzheimer's type. Well, what happens if we can remove amyloid do, do we say that the person no longer has Alzheimer's disease? And we're really just beginning to think about what does it really mean? Because we know even with complete removal of amyloid, we don't completely solve the problem. So again, you've seen this slide before, and it reminds you that we can now image amyloid in the brain through imaging studies, through PET imaging studies. And there are several different ligands that we use to measure um, to attach to the amyloid in the brain, and then it lights up on the scan so we can tell if there's amyloid in the brain. The criteria for using this amyloid imaging um, has been described for quite some time. It has, until now, not been supported by Medicare, and it will be supported by Medicare in the use um, in the planning for using this treatment. So what I wanted you to see is that while our um, criteria, I haven't changed this slide at all. I've only highlighted something, um, which is the middle bullet. It, it's to be used for individuals who have cognitive complaint with a confirmed impairment. And when AD is possible, but uncertain, 
um, after an exam, a comprehensive exam. And that's very common. And what I wanted to show you is um, in 2019, a very large study was conducted looking at amyloid imaging in patients who were recommended to it by specialists from around the country. And over a thousand patients were included in this study. And what I wanted you to see is while these individuals, these doctors who were experts thought that these people were likely to have Alzheimer's disease, when we looked at those with mild cognitive impairment, almost 45% of them did not have amyloid. So they had another cause. And even the ones who had a frank dementia, another 30% did not have amyloid. So that's why it's so important to get a good diagnosis. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because you've seen these slides before and that everybody is familiar with this. In um, uh, June of 2021, we saw the first monoclonal antibody get what we called accelerated approval. And that was based on the fact that it could move a biomarker. So I'm gonna show you um, some slides that uh, describe that. What you can see is these are the lines that show the drugs that were given. And you can see there's a very large drop in amyloid depending on what the dose is, but they're both significantly different. However, at the same time, they reported questionable results on whether or not uh, it could move cognition. And here you can see the outcome measure, which we'll talk about in a minute, the CDR sum of boxes. Um, in one study, it didn't show any difference. In another study, it barely separated. So we didn't have the clinical judgment that we needed to say this could be a traditional approval, but it did remove amyloid. Now, since that time, lecanemab has been studied in an equally large trial. And lecanemab um, learned lessons from the other study and basically ran the study a little bit more rigorously um, and a little bit more precisely. In the aducanumab studies, there were many changes and amendments during the study, but lecanemab was very focused because we'd learned a lot from the other study. And the participants in this study uh, had uh, were about 71 but they could range from 50 to 90, about 50% female. What you can see is a very high mini mental. They could have a mini mental that was perfect. It could be 30. Um, and there were no exclusions for APOE carriers. What you can see is more than 70% or about 70% had an a at least one APOE allele. You remember, we've talked about how APOE increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. It also increases the likelihood of amyloid in the brain. And what you can see is the majority had MCI as opposed to um, mild dementia. In addition, these individuals all had memory impairment on a standard memory test. They had a study partner, they had stable use of other dementia medications, um, and there was an exclusion for those individuals with bleeding disorders that were not under control. There was no... Um, uh, in that study, there was no restriction based on any anticoagulation, but uh, our PIs were made aware of the possibility that the bleeding could be a problem. So what happened? Well, you can see here a co near complete removal of amyloid. Um, and it happens very early on. By 12 months, it's nearly completely removed. And a very dramatic amount is gone, even at six months. This is an impressive finding, but we know we can remove amyloid. The real question is, can we make a difference? Well, as I mentioned to you, the primary outcome is something we call the clinical dementia rating. And for those of you who have joined us in any of our research, you may be familiar with it. We score this by talking to the patient and talking to um, a, a a study partner, and we ask questions about memory and orientation, about judgment and problem solving, about community affairs, about home and their activities, um, their hobbies or fun activities, and about personal care. And the score we get is there's a global score and a sum of boxes, right? So this is the kind of dimensions that we're asking about. It's both cognitive and functional, and that's what's being used as an outcome measure. Um, and here what you see is the lecanemab showed a significant effect. We can tell it's significant because these little bars don't touch each other. By six months, it's pretty apparent that you have a separation with lecanemab providing a slower rate of decline compared to the placebo at all of those time points. 
Um, in addition, we use some of our traditional measures, the, something called the ADAS-COG. That was a test that was developed here at Mount Sinai. And what you can see is that there's even a separation of this cognitive test, pretty dramatic, again, almost at six months. And the activities of daily living skill, the ADCS-MCI activities of daily living, this is a an important scale because it captures those early changes that might occur. And again, you see good separation starting at six months. So with this data in July of this year, the um, FDA provided uh, traditional approval for um, uh, lecanemab or lecembi, its commercial name. Um, and uh, it, uh, acknowledges some of the side effects, which I'm going to go through for you in just a minute, some of which are concerning, <clears throat> uh, but it uh, gave it a full approval. Um, this was followed by uh, CMS, which is Medicare, making an announcement that it would cover Alzheimer's disease drugs that receive this traditional approval. Um, and there are some additional uh, requirements, but in fact, um, uh, Mount Sinai and others understand this and are planning to take care of it. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was I showed you the um, effects, the number of people who were receiving uh, lecanemab who had either no ApoE allele or one or two ApoE alleles. You remember we, we each have two of ApoEs and you can have two, three or four. And we saw people who had one, four or two fours. So what I wanted to comment on is when we were considering APOE in all the times you've heard me talk, I've told you it increases the risk of dementia, but now we think it's an important variable in determining the safety of monoclonal antibodies. And I'm gonna sh show you some data that explains that pretty carefully. So we have a complex drug that has some side effects associated with it. And we really need to talk about those side effects and how we're going to manage them. And um, one study doesn't give us all the answers. And so at the time that this, these results came out, a group of experts put together what they call appropriate use recommendations. And I would argue that you, you're probably having a hard time seeing these, but I'm gonna go through them and I'm gonna tell you how we're gonna carry out these appropriate use recommendations at Mount Sinai. They really describe how you can take care, how you can identify the right patient, how you monitor to maximize safety and how you can use the drug for the um, correct population. So we should spend some time talking about those adverse events. Now, the most common side effect is infusion reactions, right? That means that at the site of the infusion that I've just described to you, you can have rash or you can have a, a full body rash or reaction like an allergic reaction to the medication or to something in the medication. Um, and, and that occurred in more than a quarter of the uh, participants in the study. Uh, the more concerning ones are what we call ARIA, which stands for amyloid imaging related abnormalities. And these are imaging abnormalities that you can see on a scan, on the MRI scan in your brain. And what we uh, can see is that the individuals who are on lecanemab have a much higher rate of these. Now there are several types. There are some that occur with what we say microhemorrhage or um, uh, specific deposits in the brain. And they occurred twice as often uh, in the individuals who were taking lecanemab as in those who uh, were not in the placebo group. Um, I think the other um, important issue is what about the symptomatic ones? So the primary symptomatic one of headache, right, occurred again more frequently in the, um, in the group that was taking lecanemab. But what I'm showing you up here in the corner is what we call a black box warning. And that warning tells us that uh, uh, 
lecanemab and other monoclonal antibodies have a particularly high risk of these brain abnormalities in individuals who are what we call homozygous E4. That is, they have two of the E4 alleles. <clears throat> so I wanted to review for you very specifically the differences. Um, and this is um, aria E and symptomatic aria, which I think is the most important thing. That's the one we care about the most when you're starting to have symptoms. And what's interesting here is while some of these abnormalities can occur in the brain of individuals who, uh, um, who have placebo, right? The symptomatic aria is relatively rare. And what you can see is it does not occur at all in the placebo group, but in the individuals who are non-carriers, it occurs at 1.4% um, of the population. In Dr. those, Dr. yes. Hi, sorry to interrupt. I just, we had a couple of questions. If you can just clarify specifically what ARIA E is. Okay, so let me just go back and read it for you. So ARIA stands for amyloid imaging related abnormalities. That's ARIA, right? And ARIA E is a specific type of ARIA, and it's the one um, uh, often associated with um, uh, specific symptomatic ARIA. Okay. And so what I'm going to do now is go on. So it's it's a change in your MRI. Remember, I told you that. Um, the uh, use of this drug is going to require many things that I'll go into in detail. One of them are changes on your MRI. And what we do when a person has a change is we make a decision whether or not we should slow down the medication or we make a decision about whether we should stop. But most importantly, we spend time asking them about symptoms. All right. So when there's a change in the brain, we start to say, okay, are you having symptoms with it? And so now this, I want to talk specifically about those brain changes associated with symptoms. So what you see here is the um, the uh, fact, as I mentioned, that the placebo group had no symptoms in this case. But if you look carefully, what you see is that there were a low rate of symptoms in those who were non-E4 carriers, right? Remember, I mentioned to you, though, that was only 30% of the group. The majority of the group were one E4 carrier. And what you see is that rate is not much higher than um, the uh, group that had no carrier. So it was 1.4 and then it went to 1.7. But if you had two homozygotes, um, sorry, two E4s, you're called a homozygote. And what you had was 9% of those individuals had um, symptomatic aria. So that tells us that that group is particularly at risk. And that's why we saw that black box warning about hom homozygous E4 carriers. Okay, so now we know um, we know exactly some of the most important risks, right? The actual physical risks of the drug. We've talked about a little bit about the um, uh, cost of the drug, but there are a few more things to know about. First of all, exactly who was it for? Well, the only way we know that is by our clinical trials. And the clinical trial that showed us this efficacy data looked at only mild AD or mild cognitive impairment, MCI. They looked at people who had a very low beginning clinical dementia rating of 0.5 or 1. All of the individuals had a memory impairment, so this wasn't being used to prevent anything. They all had amyloid positivity, either by imaging or CSF, all right? Um, they could all be taking dementia drugs. They could be taking either uh, memantine or uh, an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, right? So we know that the effect was seen across all of these individuals. The, the benefit of the lecanemab was seen. So, But this is all we know about who would be right for these. There's some more information, though, if you're trying to make a decision, what you really need to know. So... The thing to keep in mind is that the initial evaluation has many steps in it. We have to be sure that you do really have Alzheimer's disease and not some other disease. We have to be sure that you have amyloid. You have to be sure that you actually have um, an impairment in your memory or other aspect of cognition. Um, and then 
once that's decided, you have to make a decision about the commitment. So the drug requires infusions currently delivered in an infusion center. That may change, but not yet. Um, twice a month, right? Every two weeks, twice a month. The other thing is I just told you about the ARIA. And the only way we can be sure that ARIA doesn't get out of hand is by doing multiple MRIs to confirm safety. So there's a lot of stages here that will be um, important aspects when someone tries to make a decision about should we take uh, this drug, right? Admittedly, this drug is doing a great job removing amyloid, and we do see it has a clinical benefit, but there are a lot of things to think about. And what I think is particularly important, in, in addition to what I'm going to talk about in just a minute, is the fact that it is every two weeks. And if you miss it, we know that a lot of the side effects happen right at the beginning. So if you miss it or you you decide, you know, I'm going to take six months off, then you really start again. And the the um, the adverse event or the side effect risk could go up again because it would be starting new, right? We believe that it's that starting new stage when many of the adverse events occur. So, all right. Now, I don't know, but hopefully Dr. Nassan will be joining us, but I wanted to talk about what Mount Sinai is doing and whether we will be offering it. And we will. It'll be offered through the expert clinicians at our Dean Center. I think that's the most important thing for the beginning use of this drug is to use it in the safest environment. So we will have experts determining if, if one is um, eligible, if they have the right clinical features and the right biomarkers. They'll also be the ones who will know the most about how to administer the drug and what to watch for on the MRI. So that's very exciting. Dr. Snow, um, I just wanted to note that Dr. Nassan is with us. Oh, great. So I'm going to finish uh, this slide and then invite him to update us or correct me. <laughs> so um, we need to confirm the brain amyloid. I've told you that it's either through um, PET imaging or CSF. We're hoping someday that might also through, be through blood, but right now that's not really quite available to make the decision about this. Um, we're going to strongly recommend that uh, everyone get their APOE4 status because it may not be right for those who have an E44. Um, so I think it's also important to know that our physicians will be weighing the risk of anticoagulant use, right? If you're um, needing an anticoagulant, this may not be the drug for you. Um, clinical evaluations uh, uh, may be able to use some of our research results. So if you're here with us and you've been part of our studies and you've had amyloid imaging as part of a study or you've had apolipoprotein status determined, you may be able to use that to get started with your medication. The Dean Center is um, prioritizing uh, medication appointments. So it's a great place to have gotten your care and it's a great place to find the experts who can move this forward. We're awaiting the infusion center to finalize the protocols because as I described, they all occur in an infusion center and we have to carefully monitor for infusion reactions and we have to monitor for MRI. And this will take quite a bit of coordination. But as I said, Dr. Nassan, uh, who's going to be able to answer some questions for us, I know, um, will uh, be able to tell you what we think the the upside is of this and, and what the risks are. And I think it's really important to have a balanced view. Um, I'm going to, I have just a few more slides that I'm going to go on to, and then we'll open it up and ask Dr. Nassan to give his comments as well. So what else is coming? This is an interesting summary from last year. And I wanted to say some of these things we already know um, are off, uh, are, are we have the answers to. But aducanumab, we are running new trials actually today. We're just beginning a site visit to see if we can demonstrate the 
clinical benefits of aducanumab in a better study designed to actually see the measure without so many changes in it. Maybe we'll find out that it can also work. Denanumab has also been publishing its data demonstrating um, an effect on both cognition and amyloid reduction. Those studies are a little bit more complicated because they actually require um, two types of imaging, both amyloid and tau. I'm not sure how we'll bring it to the market. And then also the advantage is denanumab is a monthly infusion. Gantanurumab is now no longer in studies. It was one of the drugs we were so hopeful for because it was um, could be delivered by a sub-Q injection. However, we didn't get low enough amyloid in that, and we didn't see the clinical benefit. In some ways, the gantanurumab study reminds us that maybe there really is a connection between lowering amyloid and seeing a clinical benefit. And so I've told you about the lecanumab study, but I think next will probably be the denanumab studies. Um, so I just want to summarize for, with a couple of take-home mes messages and, and considerations. So where are our next challenges? Well, if amyloid removal is yielding clinical benefit in symptomatic cases, the next questions that we're asking in research is could it prevent symptoms in preclinical cases? And there are two studies that are ongoing to determine if that's the case. If amyloid defines the disease, remember I told you about that framework? Would removal define a cure? Well, we don't think so. It didn't completely change the trajectory of, dis, of um, decline. And so now we're going to have to redefine how we um, think about Alzheimer's disease, especially since it seems to continue to exist after we've removed amyloid. Um, could similar approaches prevent amyloid buildup, um, creating true prevention, maybe before there's any amyloid at all? And can modification of the other things, the tau and the neurodegeneration, answer those kind of questions and give us a chance to see better benefits, more benefits in patients with Alzheimer's disease? So let me just give you my take homes, which are, we really now have an approved treatment that can remove amyloid from the brain. And we have seen clearly that in well-conducted studies, it has a clinical effect the treatment has risks, and it really requires a commitment of time and effort. Um, the benefit is robust, right? All of our studies are showing that these monoclonal antibodies can remove amyloid. And when they do these studies in a direct removal, we do see a clinical benefit. It's small, but it is robust. It's apparent in all of our studies. So if you're interested, contact your doctor or the Dean Center or another experienced dementia expert because we have so much more to learn. And as you know, the ADRC is always here to answer your questions. So I'm gonna stop my slides now. And I believe we have a few questions. Yeah. Um, Dr. Nassan, um, I wanted to invite you to join us. Um, I don't know if you wanted to make any comments on what Dr. Sano is um, saying, or you want to take some questions. Yeah, no, thank you for inviting me. I, I couldn't have presented this better than what Dr. Sano presented. This is really a wonderful summary of uh, the, uh, where we are with uh, the offering and implementing uh, Lekanema. Great. So I had um, a couple of questions that came to me um, directly. Um, one of them was um, you were talking about that you have to confirm a diagnosis of early AD or MCI due to AD before you can be considered. And you talked about a number of things like APOE4 and cognitive testing and MRIs and PET scans. How much of that's gonna have to be done um, in order to determine if someone's eligible for that now? Well, as I have uh, mentioned, for new people who are just starting to become symptomatic, have not been in any research protocols, there's quite a bit to be done. We um, can see that there's a difference in um, the likelihood of having amyloid, even a very good um, uh, a very good expert who might have taken part in the ideas study um, 
in that cohort, more than 40% um, of the individuals who they thought might have amyloid, might have Alzheimer's disease, did not. So that's a very big deal. Um, also, you know, the desire or the need to get your um, uh, APOE um, status determined can slow people down. It may be something they haven't thought about because it does have um, consequences for other family members, potential consequences for other family members. So those are uh, important issues. I think the other issue is that it takes time to get scans done. It takes time to schedule them. It takes time to move the ligands. Or the, that's the marker that we use in these scans around the country. So around the country, it's going to be a process. It will take time to be able to see people on uh, treatment. As Dr. Nassan told us or reminded me that we also have to set up our infusion centers. So there are a lot of stages to getting things done. But that was a related question, which is how how soon is Mount Sinai um, going to be able to provide the infusions, Dr. Nassan? We we are hoping it will be, or we'll be able to do our first infusion in the next few weeks to a month. Uh, we've put a lot of the pieces together. Uh, the, the last piece that needs to be finalized is the uh, workflow for the nurses that... Uh, handle the actual infusion uh, from, you know, arriving, putting an IV for the patient and, and uh, you know, knowing how to dilute the drug uh, and how to administer it, but also how to react uh, to potential side effects that may occur and monitor all of, all of that. So we're having our last few pieces put together for that process. And once that's in place, we will be ready to start infusing. We already have a few patients that have been evaluated uh, for their eligibility uh, and counseled. And uh, um, the, the, some of them are just waiting to get the first infusion. So a, a related question for either either one of you um, is had to do with the treatment itself, which was how long does the infusion take at any given visit? And once uh, Dr. Sano had said, once you start, you know, if you stop and start again, there may be some safety concerns. So is the implication that once you start this, you're on this for the rest of your life? So um, I can say that, and I I'm, can't wait to hear what Dr. Nassan has to say, because uh, he's in the driver's seat for this. But unfortunately, as part of the research team, we've given him all the information we have, and it's maybe not enough. Um, what we know is that uh, it, the infusion time is about an hour, but you know, uh, you can't simply imagine that you're just going to walk in and walk out in an hour because we want to take a look at you before and after. If you've had weight changes, that may change uh, the amount of drugs. So all of that needs to be addressed while you're sitting there. If you've had any other side effects, if you've had any medication changes, they'll be asking you about all of those things when you come in for the infusion. I want to comment, and, and I, I know, I think Dr. Nassan will agree on this. Um, the infusion center is um, staffed with incredible nursing staff and other medical professionals who have infused drugs that have this or more risk factor associated with them. So it's a completely... It's, it's the best it could be. Um, I would say, that being said, it'll be a new treatment for those centers. And so those centers want to be sure they have all of the protocols in place. So I, I'm really excited that we're using existing centers. And I'm really excited that they're so intent on learning how to do this the right way. So Dr. Nassan, anything else? Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Part about yeah. you have to be on it forever. <laughs> yeah which we don't know yet, I assume. Yeah. Uh, no, I agree with everything you said, Dr. Sano. And uh, and also you uh, you reminded us and the team that, you know, uh, Sinai was a site, you know, for the study. And, and many of the nurses that are still currently in the research unit have administered these infusion and they are working with our infusion center nurses to, uh, to train them and put in, in place some of that protocol. So that's literally happening, you know, as we speak this mm -hmm. this week. Uh, so that's great. And uh, for the 
for the question of how long, it, it's a question that I think we also have and we don't know. The, the trial was done over 18 months and over these 18 months is when they were able to demonstrate the clinical benefit that Dr. Sano has, has presented. But we don't yet know what happens beyond the 18 months. We do know that ISAIA is doing, the pharmaceutical company is doing an extended um, open label study for people who accepted to continue being followed up by them and continue taking the drug even after the 18 month. We hope that at some point they'll be able to report their findings for what does this look like over a longer period of time uh, so that we can gain better insight as to whether this is an indefinite type medication or do we just do it for a period of time until the plaques are done or what have you. I think uh, some questions are still up in the air for the time being. Okay, thank you. Um, we have several questions. Um, obviously a big concern for a lot of people is the safety. And I think Dr. Sano addressed some of this, but there's still a couple of remaining questions. So one person was asking um, what the risk level for, for brain swelling and death is. And a related question was, is the drug considered to be safe if you don't have um, homozygous E4 or on anticoagulants or have evidence of brain bleeds, for example? So, um, you know, safety uh, is a number and it's every individual's uh, safety tolerance that has to be decided. And one of the things I think is so interesting about this um, is the study was done in mild individuals and MCI, so they could make a decision about the safety and they were willing to join the study based on knowing that these were the kinds of side effects. Many of these side effects were written in the consent forms and they were completely aware of them. Um, and the FDA's approval would, re would um, indicate that they probably feel that this is a safety that this drug can live with, all right? But it also, I think what's really important is the E44, the homozygote um, E4 individual has such an increase in symptomatic, one in 10, that it has what we call a black box warning. And what does that mean? It means that the FDA thinks it's so important that everybody should really take two moments, not just one, but two, to really think about it. It doesn't say you cannot have it or you cannot use it, but it says it's so important to think about it, you need to balance it. So it becomes an individual issue. For some people, that safety risk isn't good enough. For other people who have seen family members who have had very dramatic dementia, they're sort of willing to take the risk. It's a very personal thing. But what I really like is we try hard to put it in the hands of the patient. Dr. Nassan, you want to add anything? No, I wholeheartedly agree. And uh, maybe just highlight something really important, Dr. Sano, uh, that you mentioned, which is uh, it, it's, it's, it's a statistical numbers game. And it comes down to what the individual patient and their family decide is uh, acceptable to them or not. Because while we can say that statistically speaking, there's a higher risk of bleeding for homozygous. There's a higher risk of bleeding for people with anticoagulation. That also doesn't mean that if you don't have these things, then you are safe, like it's not gonna happen to you. Mm -hmm. You may be the one person or whatever, you know, out of the out of the smaller percentage that, that will get this. So on an individual level, the statistics don't really apply in the same way. And it's going to have to be a conversation between you and your neurologist about what could potentially happen even if the risk of it is one in a million or one in a thousand, if there's one possible chance that it could one happen. One in a hundred. <laughs> and yeah. If, if there's one possible chance that it's going to happen, then you you need to uh, take that into consideration when you decide if you want to go on this treatment or not. Um, Dr. Sano, another question comes from someone um, regarding that table you showed about the differences in um, rate of decline between a placebo group and the can be group. And the question was, is there a way to kind of put that into real world <laughs> terms? Like what does that, might that look like for yeah. a particular person? 
You know, the rate of decline is a really interesting um, question because it's not only uh, what it means for you as an individual, it it's also dependent on where you start, right? And so a person who starts with um, poorer performance may actually have a bigger number, but you're only saving their, their cognitive status to a different level. Um, there have been lots of attempts to uh, define this. Um, and then the other question that we don't know yet is, does the benefit get bigger over time? And we don't know that, but you did see that those groups were still separating. Um, and so we know what the benefit is at 18 months. Um, I can tell you about some recent data that I looked at with Dr. Zhu from our data core that talked about the uh, CDR in individuals who are in this range. And when we look at the rate of decline in those individuals, what I can tell you is that the places we see the benefit in sort of real life expenditures or cost are not in medical care or not in, it's too early to talk about delay in nursing home, but where we see them is in benefits in the ability to work or volunteer a little bit longer and also in lower need for that informal help you might be getting. So maybe um, it would reduce the need for someone to be helping you with your financial matters as intently as they might otherwise. Um, we didn't see a difference in um, that size effect in this group in hospitalizations or medical needs. So we can't really tell yet whether or not these benefits are going to extend to those other kinds of benefits. But right. it does seem like they're gonna be very important for your ability to continue doing your hobbies or your volunteer work or even your job um, which is an important, um, at this early stage, can be an important outcome. A, a related question was um, on on the slide that, that indicated that people in the study were allowed to be on other dementia medications. Mm -hmm. And so was there any data that showed that being on, um, say, Aricept and the study drug, you know, conferred a greater benefit or was that kind of data looked at? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And in fact, that was a very specific sub-analysis. And basically the sub-analysis demonstrated an equal size benefit, whether or not you were on a cholinesterase inhibitor or actually was any of the um, Alzheimer drugs or uh, dementia drugs. Um, uh, it was equal if you were on it or off it. So what that means is the difference was the same. So if you believe you're getting a boost from one of those drugs, this difference was on top of that boost. So um, the study actually did stratification by that. So they have good strength to answer that question. It doesn't seem to it it doesn't um, change your ability to see an effect. Uh, and if you look at the lines, you see lines are slightly higher in the group that were taking medications than the one that was not. Take, well, taking underlying medications data yet that would compare Lakembi to directly to medications that are already approved for Alzheimer's disease. Well, in fact, we do because if you look at those stratified analysis, you see that Lakembi plus the cholinesterase inhibitor does better than the placebo group without Lakembi taking the cholinesterase inhibitor. So, in a in a sense, it does give us that information. Well, that's, okay. Um, someone else um, asked about how to get it. You said there were um, rules about getting it, including having to join a registry, and they were wondering what that was about. Right. So um, the Medicare would like us to collect some information about its use to ensure that it has benefits to the patient, um, the Medicare beneficiary. And um, each site that's giving it can, can set up a registry. So it, it's done by the local site. I'm going to um, ask Dr. Nassan. I believe we've actually tried to establish that registry here, and he can tell you a little more about it. 
Yeah, so uh, essentially the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services have created an online registry uh, that they are requiring in order to reimburse their, their the 80% you know, portion uh, of the medication and everything else. Um, it's really uh, very, they're, they're asking for very little information. Basically, we, we log in with our own identifiers as, as clinicians. We, have, we all have a national provider identification number that we have to put in and the identifier for the, for the Medicare beneficiary. Uh, so that's how the system recognizes you know, who you are. And then they're asking for simple things like what's the diagnosis, um, what is what is the score of a screening test, like a mini mental status exam? What were the findings of an amyloid PET scan, or you know the confirmation of the Alzheimer's disease? You know, did it confirm it? Yes or no? Um, which medication they are receiving? Because yes, there's lecanemab now, but there might be others, you know, down the road. And uh, and what's the functional status uh, uh, through scales? You know, like is, 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 are the patients you know able to be independent in their day to day activities or you know, how do they fall on that? That's really essentially what they're asking about and whether there are, are anticoagulation. So they're looking at safety primarily um, and whether people will have side effects on this. We are only required to submit this form uh, uh, five times at the beginning of the treatment and then another four times every six months for the next two years for 24 months. And that's what uh, what CMS is, uh, is collecting. So Dr. Nassan, I just want to uh, be sure I'm right about this. So the patient will probably get a consent so that they'll know you're entering them in a registry. But in That's fact, all the, all the work is done by the doctor and the medical team, not by the patient. Correct, correct. And and to your point, Dr. Sano, the patient will will actually have to sign a consent for various other things, you know, to make right. sure that they understood the side effects, the risks, and they are moving forward with the treatment. So there will be a consent form being signed as a requirement for everybody who would like to pursue the infusion. Right. And this is not atypical. I don't, I'm not sure how many people have had other medical procedures, but you often have signed a consent. Sometimes when you're having those procedures, you don't stop and think, oh yes, this is a consent. And the consent is not only that you're having it, but that I've told you about the risks. And that's what we want to make sure of. Terrific, thank you. All right, so, um... The last question before we go to our poll question is, um, are there common medications that people might take that, that could have an adverse, um, besides an anticoagulant, for example, an adverse effect with this drug? Any common blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes medications that people often take as they get older? So you, you can't be on this infusion if you have another immunologic disorder that require treatment with immune type therapy. So people are receiving immunotherapy or, or other monoclonal antibodies for, for something else, which could be, you know, it could be, thing, it could be various things, you know, uh, rheumatoid arthritis could be an example, you know, in severe cases or like other stuff. So that's contraindicated. And obviously the anticoagulation, not, necess not necessarily uh, like a baby aspirin or a Plavix, like these are not uh, contraindications, but uh, but blood thinners that are that are sort of have heavier uh, ha heavier uh, uh, and more involved blood thinners such as uh, Epixaban, uh, so on and so forth. Terrific, thank you. Can I also make a comment? Um, you know, one thing I wanted to say is uh, if. Many people take supplements uh, that can have anticoagulating effects and may not be aware of it. So if someone's considering this medication, it's really important to share with your doctor everything that you're taking, right? There are many agents that people think of as, you know, just health food store agents and they're safe. But many of them give very high doses of things that actually can have anticoagulant effects and can interact with other things that you might be taking that can have the same thing. It's really important to pay attention to everything you take. That's a good point, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna ask Dr. Luizos to put up our two polling questions um, and you can just answer right there on your screen. And while people are answering that, actually, uh, Dr. Sanno, I had a question personally. Um, <laughs> in term for particularly for for those who are here who are participants in the ADRC. So, as we go forward with research and we are investigating new agents that may help, 
um, will people um, be allowed to be treated with a Kembe in these new studies, or do we not know yet? It's a it's a very important question. And I can tell you about uh, some studies that we're doing and how we're handling it. But, you know, I believe this information is going to change over time as we get more comfortable with the drug or if we learn that it has certain risks that we need to consider. So, for example, we have several studies in which we're looking at individuals who have amyloid but have no symptoms. What we've decided is if those people convert to a symptomatic stage, we will systematically discontinue them from that part of the study and allow them to enter a treatment phase because we think that's the right thing to do. There are other medications that don't work through infusion that may work through oral medication or may work on different um, different. Uh, aspects of that cascade. It may not be on the amyloid, it may be on the tau, or it may be on a, um, an inflammatory marker. And so if they don't work in those same systems, we're thinking that we would um, allow people in, but we would do what we call stratify so that we can look at those people who are on it separately from those people who are off Lakenby or other approved medications. But it's truly a um, uh, balancing act. It may be that um, for some people, twice a week is just too much, and they might want to enter a study where we're giving an infusion that's um, only once a month, or we may be giving an oral pill that works in the exact same system. And if we do, it wouldn't be safe to give them on top of each other. And that would be the only reason why we would not study them on top of each other is because we're not sure about the safety. We really try to design our studies so that we can answer questions for real people. And if real people are on the medication, we don't want to exclude them. And if real people have made a decision, I don't want to be on the medication, then we want to include them, but we want to be able to answer the question for both groups. So just to clarify, you, you meant twice a month, not twice a week. Okay. I'm sorry, I did mean twice a month. <laughs> right. Someone just asked that. I mean, it's already no. enough. Let's not. Let's no, no, no. Twice a month, but and but you know, maybe so we'll have one that's less frequently, or maybe we'll have one that you can administer at home, and maybe that frequency is so problematic for you that you'd want to try something else. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sano. Um, uh, Dr. Nassan had to hop off, but um, it was a wonderful presentation and. Right. Thank you everybody who joined us today. Um, if you'd like um, a copy of Dr. Sano's slides, you can email uh, Dr. Luisos um, and uh, who sent you the invite for today and Dr. Sano can prepare some, you know, a, a version of the slides that you could take a look at later. And if you wanna hear some of this information again, and within the next few weeks, this lecture will be posted on the ADRC website online if you wanna take a look again. And of course, we're always here to answer questions. Um, and thank you all so much for joining and have a terrific day and see you next time.